For the past few weeks, we've been looking at the subject, why we believe baptism is essential salvation. We have been examining teachings of the Lord's Church that have come under fire from those who misrepresent us. So what we are trying to do in these series of lessons is give you the biblical reason and the biblical understanding of why we practice and preach what we do. And so last week we ended up looking at Acts 2.38. And we showed that both parts, repentance and baptism, are necessary in order for man to gain remission of sin. And they're connected by the word and. And we saw that they were both going in the same direction towards the salvation of one's soul. In Matthew 26, 28, I made reference to this last week. I didn't read it, but I made a reference to it. I'll read it today. In Matthew 26, verse 28, Jesus himself said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Now again, this word for the remission of sin is the exact quote of for the remission of sin in Acts 2.38. The Greek terminology is the same in both passages. In both passages, that word is translated for the remission of sin. Now, the same expression in both English and Greek. And in the Greek, this word ace means in order to obtain. Man needs to gain the blood. He needs uh, the blood that was shed by Jesus on the cross would be for, in order for man to obtain the mission of sin. He didn't obtain the mission of sin before Jesus died. Jesus had to die in order for man to obtain the mission of sin. Now in Acts 2.38, repentance and baptism is essential if man wants remission of sin. If he wants remission of sin, then he must repent and be baptized. The Greek and the English are in agreement and teach that it is absolutely essential and necessary for man to do both. Now, let's look at 1 Peter 3, verse number 21. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. The light figure we into even baptism does now also save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In another religious discussion that was held with a fellow from West Virginia on the radio, discussing the subject of the necessity of baptism, he said there wasn't a passage in the Bible that ties salvation with baptism. Well, the gospel preacher said, well, let's turn to 1 Peter 3, verse 21. And I'm going to ask you to read it for our listening audience. So he turned in and he began to read. He said, the light figure were into even baptism, and then he stopped. And the gospel preacher said, well, read the rest of the verse. And then he began again. The light figure were into even baptism, and he stopped again. He said, friend. Please, just continue reading. Read the whole verse. And then he started the third time, and he said, the light figure we're into even baptism. He says, I don't believe it. Well, we know you don't believe it, but we want you to read it, what it says anyway, for the listening audience. We know you don't believe it, but we want you to read it, and I'll help you out. Baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, now that I read it, I want the audience to understand he doesn't believe it. Now, I already knew that he didn't believe it, but what was his argument? His argument was there was no passage that tied baptism and salvation together. This passage does. It says, when it's even baptism does also now save us. Baptism does now save us. That ties them together. And so the man was wrong. He does tie them together. I know he didn't want to read it because if he read it, that would give his position away. But I know he doesn't believe it, but that's what the text says. Baptism does now save us. That's what it says. Does now save us. Now, baptism does not save us. Now again, this comes down to which statement do you believe? Which statement do you believe to be true? First Peter 3 says, Baptism does now save us. 
And others who oppose baptism say, baptism does not save us. Now, one of them is right and one of them is wrong. This one was said by the Apostle Peter, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This one is said by the religions and the dictates and the teachings of men. And so you, dear listener, you're going to have to make a decision. Which one is telling you the truth? Is it what the Apostle Paul wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Or is it the theology of man who have a different understanding and a different agenda and make a different argument? You're going to have to decide which one of those you believe to be true. Personally, I believe the first because I know God cannot lie to me. Hebrews 6 verse 18. Now, in 1 Peter 3.21, you have the old world and the new world. And you have the old life and new life. There's a contrast here. Peter uses a contrast between what happens in the days of Noah and what happens in the days of Christ. The old world, there were eight souls saved by water. Eight souls were saved by water. Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. Eight souls in total in all. And they were saved in water. And when it talks about the old life of sin and the new life of the saved. Baptism now also saves us. Just like the water saved those under the old law by lifting the ark off the earth and allowing it to rise so it would spare their lives. In light figure, in a spiritual way, the water of baptism puts to death the old life, buries the old life, the old life of sin, and we arise to walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 3 and 4. And so again, it's which you believe, from the old to the new. Which one do you believe is accurate according to the text? The old world and the old life of sin. The new world and the new way of life. Because we're going to live for him and we're going to mold our life around his teaching. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now I want you to notice what this says. You are all children of God by faith. What is the evidence of one faith by in Christ? What evidence is revealed or what evidence can be seen that this one believes in Christ Jesus? Well, the one that has been baptized into Christ. You put on Christ. See, your, evidence, your faith is on display because you put your faith to work. You were baptized into his name and you have put him on. In other words, you have taken on the mantle of living your life according to his standard. And you submitted to his term in order to obtain salvation. And again, this is what the passage teaches. Now, there are many people who deny that plain teaching, but you examine it and you study it and you make the decision for yourself. Excuse me. You are children of God by faith. You are a child of God by faith. Well, denotes the reason for which follows. Okay? You are a child of God for what reason? For what reason is and have been baptized into Christ. That's what you did. You, you believe, and it denotes the reason, and you've been baptized, and have been baptized, for what reason? You were baptized in order to get into Christ. And in Christ is all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1 verse 3. One of those spiritual blessings is baptism, and that's where the blood is offered. And so again, Galatians 3.26 is another one of our proof texts that can't be gotten around. These men were told to repent and be baptized in the name of Christ by his authority. That's what gives baptism power because it's by the authority of Christ. Now, we've looked at the evidence. We looked at the teaching of Jesus himself in Mark 16.16, 16, in Acts 2.38 for the remission of sin. It now saves us, 1 Peter 3.21, and is baptized into Christ, where all spiritual blessings are. And so these are these are not all, but these are four passages I want to submit to you this morning to show you that there is biblical evidence, there is biblical evidence that we can turn to that demonstrates that man must uh, do these things in order to obtain what he seeks 
And that is the salvation of his soul. Well, what about the cases of conversion? What about those examples in the Bible of men and women who have been who have followed what God says? Now, again, this is the list. I want you to take a very close attention. We're going to look at Jew, the Samaritans, the eunuch, Saul, Cornelius, Lydia, Jailer, and the Corinthians. Now, on your left, these are all the individuals, either either alone or with someone else, that they did something. Now, according to the Samaritans, they believed the preaching of the kingdom by Philip, and they believed and they were baptized. It says in Acts 8, verse 12, and then in that verse 12, we see them submitting to baptism. You have the eunuch in Acts 8, after one sermon that began in the prophets, prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 7 and 8. From that one scripture, the Bible says in Acts 8, 35, that he began to preach to him Jesus. And then he came to a certain body of water, it says, and he said, here is water, what does hinder me to be baptized? And Paul told Philip, if I believe with all thy heart, thou mayest, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and he went down into the water and baptized him for the remission of sin. And as he came up, the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. Again, that's a divine sign that this was meeting God's approval. Then you had Saul of Tarsus, Acts 22, 16. And uh, Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sin, calling on the name of the Lord. And then we have the household of Cornelius. The household of Cornelius, where the Holy Spirit fell on them, just like it did us at the beginning. Acts uh, chapter uh, 11, verse 15 and following. And we see that in, in John 12, that having favor with the church, they went around adding all daily those that should be saved, being both Jew and Gentile, according to the words in Denver. And so then you have Lydia, who was baptized, and you have the jailer, then you have the Corinthians. You know, all of these, they demonstrated their faith and obedience by their action. And their action was one of baptism. Salvation is only in Christ. Redeemed in His blood, Ephesians 1, 7. Made near by the blood of Christ, Ephesians 2.13. Reconciled in one body by the cross, Ephesians 2.16. You see, the blood, we're baptized in order to obtain the blood. The blood redeems us, brings us near to God, and reconciles us from being out of fellowship with God to being in fellowship with God. This is done by the blood and the cross. The blood and the cross enable those three things to ha happen simultaneously. Salvation is in Christ and in all conversions. All of them did exactly the same thing in order to obtain salvation. Okay, again, what we see is God's word and his instruction being respected and being planned. Now, now that we've defined the question, and we know what the question is, let me ask, what is the evidence? Now, I've, I've showed you the question. We've looked at that. Now let's look at the evidence that supports the conclusions that we have suggested in this lesson. And now we're going to look at the objections. I've defined the questions. I've looked at the evidence. I gave you the evidence contained in the Bible. We looked at Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. We can add to that 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. We can talk, talk about three, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Uh, we can talk about... Uh, Acts 2.47, and there's just a host of other Bible-related passages that we could give you, but suffice it to say, we've given you enough evidence to reach a conclusion. And so now, what about the objections? Surely, whenever you teach this, men have objections to it. They think they have ways around what the truth teaches. Well, let's see if they do. 
Let's see if the objections have merit. Now, people who take the argument that man is saved by faith only, they argue that if faith eliminates baptism, it eliminates repentance. Because we just read that in Galatians chapter 3. Can't mean faith alone, because the only time those two words are used alone is in Acts 17. And, excuse me, not, but James chapter 2. James chapter 2 says faith without works is dead being alone, just like the spirit without the body is dead. James 2, 24 through 26. So James says it can't be faith alone. That's not what's under consideration. Many who believe but not saved. James chapter 2. It says even the demons believe and tremble. In John chapter 8, you have those that believe that were but were afraid of the Jews and would not uh, confess Christ because they didn't want to be cast out of the synagogue. Again, what we see is we see if faith eliminates baptism, it eliminates repentance, and it's not necessary. And it can't mean faith only because God condemns that through the writing of James in James 2.24. And many who believe but were not saved. They would believe, but they were fear of reprisal from the Romans, and so they did not believe. Well, they're lost. Excuse me. Jesus said, believe and is baptized, Mark 16, 16. Either you believe that statement or you don't. This men work so hard to get around it, why not just accept what it teaches? Why do we work so hard to go on a plain Bible passage? It's beyond me. Saved by faith, saved by the blood. If blood eliminates baptism, it eliminates faith. If you don't need the blood, then you don't need baptism. And if you don't need baptism in the blood, then you really don't need a faith that eliminates that too. Blood and baptism are tied together. In Revelation 1 verse 5, it says you were washed in the blood of the Lamb. In Acts 22 verse 16, Ananias told Saul, And what Saul, why does thou tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sin, calling on the name of the Lord. We're washed in the blood of the Lamb, and we're washed in that blood when we come to baptism. In Matthew 26, 28, it says that he shed the blood for remission of sin, and in order to tame remission of sin, we must be baptized, Acts 2, 38. And so blood and baptism are joined together at the hip. They are two things that are joined together by God. And therefore, it is difficult for men with their false theories and their false teaching to get around the plain, the plain evidence that demonstrates that God intended not to be baptism only. Saved by faith, saved by blood, and then they want to bring up the thief on the cross. Well, thief on the cross, there's a lot of things that you're going to have to consider about the thief. Number one thing about the thief is that it is not said that the thief repented. Nothing says that the, the thief repented. He just asked the Lord to remember him when he came to his kingdom. Don't say anything about repentance. The thief lived and died under the Old Testament. And according to passages like Hebrews 9, 16 and 17, the testator, the will of a, of a man, is not enforced until man died. While he's living, it's not enforced. So Jesus was living at this time. And so his uh, will was to do the Father's will. Under the New Testament, Jesus commands. Yes, Jesus does command. But Mark 16, 16, the command is to believe and be baptized. That's what's commanded. And so that's what must be done. Saved by faith, saved by the blood, just like the thief on the cross. Cornelius was saved without it. Cornelius would say, without you better go back and read Acts chapter 10. He had to accept baptism too. If the reception of the Holy Spirit proves salvation before baptism, it proves salvation before faith. The Holy Spirit fell on Peter as he began to speak. Began, past tense to begin, to set him upon some action to start. Finish to bring or come to an end, to complete. And so that's in Acts 2.42. Peter's sermon is the Holy Spirit baptism proves that man needs in order to obtain salvation, 
and it is <coughs> salvation that comes in conjunction with a man's faith. Again, he will not submit to baptism if he doesn't believe that it's going to do anything for him. This began, this ends. And so it's our obedience that ends the process. Cornelius was saved without it. No, he wasn't saved without it. He had to, can he forbid, can he forbid these that they should not receive baptism as we have, who received the Holy Spirit just like us? No, they had to be saved in the same way that the Jews were in the days of Matthew. Again, this does not say he is not baptized. He was baptized, and it's not because in order to obtain salvation, because he would attain that by his obedience. Now remember this parallel. God's not going to say the ridiculous. He's not going to say things that are ridiculous and redundant. If a man doesn't eat, he won't digest anything. If a man doesn't get baptized, then he's never going to get to the water. Again, we must keep our eye on the text. And we must be true to what the text says, and not to our theories and theology. If one does not eat, he will not digest. Very simple. Does not say it is not baptized. This is a this is a ignorance argument. This is an ignorance argument. Mark 16, 9 through 20 is not reliable. I've already answer these two arguments. Number one, <coughs> this is in very few manuscripts, and the ones that are, where Mark 9 verse 20 is not there, have a gap between chapters. And so the other reliable texts, they're, they're reliable, and all of them include Mark 16, 9 through 20. It does not say it is not baptized. Again, we reiterate as we did from the first class, if a person doesn't believe, He's never going to get to the water. He's never going to submit to baptism if he doesn't believe in God. Again, that would be a redundant thing for God to say. Is Mark 16, 20 reliable? Well, let's answer the question. Must missing from the same uh, manuscript, the Vatican, Hebrews 9, 14 and following, Timothy, Titus, Revelation of Philemon, Sinaitic, Matthew 1, 24, John in parts in 2 Corinthians. Do anybody question those passages because we don't have actual handwritten uh, copies of those original pages? No, nobody questions that. It is found in hundreds of MSS, the majority of the MSS do contain it. The vast majority, by a large standard, by a large number, have Mark 16, 9 through 20. And so the majority of the evidence is on the side that it was there. The translators left it in, 47 King James Version, 101 American Standard, and 119 men in New Kingdom, uh, New King James Version, translated the Bible, looked at the arguments, looked at the wording to make sure that it was uh, authenticated correctly. Translators who left in 47 uh, uh, during the King James Read, 101 of the American Standard Version, and 119 in the North Kentucky Division. Authenticity not questioned, only its genuineness. The wise question the authenticity, we want to look at the, the uh, genuineness. Every point in verse 9 through 20 can be made and corroborated by other texts. No statement, no statement not true. It is true. Every point that I can make in Mark 16.16, I can find that same point in other scriptures. I don't need Mark 16.16 to prove my point. It's the clearest passage that proves my point, but if you want to argue and fuss about it, we can remove that and we'll use the other passages that we looked at, and they're just as strong in favor of the affirmative answer that man must be baptized in order to be saved. Now, every point in Matthew, uh, Mark 9, 20, 16, 9, 20, can be corroborated by other texts. No statement not true. Yes, that is true. Every other point in the text can be backed up and validated by another passage of Scripture. Think about that. Authenticity is not the question, only the genuineness of the person who's teaching. 
saved by faith, saved by the blood, saved the thief on the cross. Cornelius was not saved without it. He obeyed the gospel just like he did on Pentecost. Does not say and is not baptized. No, because it would be redundant and it would be ignorant. And Mark 16, 9 through 20 is not reliable. Again, those who take that argument are those who don't like baptism. Those who want to try to find a way around it. And again, it's not being honorable, it's not being true. Now, why we believe that baptism is essential to salvation? We've looked at the question, we've looked at the evidence, and we looked at the objections. Now, at the end of this lesson today, we have covered this subject. We have showed you in the Bible why we believe it's essential, why we practice it, and why we teach it. We have answered the objections, we have looked at the evidence, and we've answered the question. Now, remember where we began. We began by saying three questions. Is baptism essential salvation? By our study of God's Word, and we examined it together, it says that it is. At what point does man's faith save him? When he's been obedient. When he's been obedient, read James 2, 14 through 26. And at what point is the blood applied? When that contacted through the waters of baptism, Romans 6, 1 through 7, and Colossians 2, verse 13, and 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we presented the evidence. We've taught you exactly what we practice, why we practice it, what we teach, and where the evidence is. Now the rest is up to you. If you can prove that any point that I made in these lessons is incorrect, that I mishandled God's Word, that I misapplied it, that I mistaught it, then you bring that to my attention, show me with the Bible, and I will come on this program and I will recant everything I said. But will you have the same courage to do that if you see that what you've been doing is wrong, inaccurate, and not according to God's Word? I'm willing. What about you? Time will tell.